The following message by Pastor Sal Massa is made available by Cross Angle Ministries. For more information, visit us online at crossangleministries.com. Currently, Pastor Sal is teaching from the book of Daniel, a book that reveals prophecy that is now history and relevant to the times we live in. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I uh, hope you had uh, a good week as uh, since the last time we spoke, and uh, I'm excited as we begin uh, chapter 5. Uh, but before we do that, let's open in a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, I just want to thank you for everyone who's listening in, and I pray, Lord God, that uh, as we hear the word of God, we would be touched by it. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Please help me, Lord God, as I uh, speak about your uh, wonderful word. And I pray that our hearts and minds are open, that we would understand, that we would remember, and that we would be encouraged, challenged. And if we need correcting, I pray, Lord, that you would do that in our lives. Lord, we want to give you the glory. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, as I said, I hope you had a great uh, uh, number of days since the last time uh, you joined in with me. I know it's been a very busy week uh, for me and very excited about the things God is doing. And uh, as we begin uh, chapter 5, uh, it's important to note that about 70 years have passed since the events of chapter 1. While Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 BC, Daniel simply doesn't record those who came after him. Chapter 5 takes place about 23 years after chapter 4, and we find King Belshazzar ruling Babylon. Now prior to him, there were several other rulers. Nebuchadnezzar was succeeded by his son, evil Merodach, who ruled for about two years. He was murdered by Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law, who ruled for four years. At his death, his, he was succeeded by his son, Labishi Murduk, who ruled for only two months and was assassinated and succeeded by Nabinidus, I have trouble pronouncing that, uh, Nabonidus who married the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, and he reigned for 17 years. Now, uh, Nabonidus resided in Tima in Arabia, which was about 500 mi miles south of Babylon. And he lived there for 10 of his 17 years of reign, uh, probably for religious reasons and to conquer more lands for his empire. Now, Belshazzar, uh, his eldest son was appointed by his father as co-regent to rule Babylon while he was gone. Now, this co-regency explains why Belshazzar was called king and why he ruled as the number two uh, person of rank in the, in the kingdom while his father, Nabonidus, actually held the throne. This also explains why he spoke of a third ruler in verse 7. Read with me Daniel 5, 7. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who could read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, third ruler is mentioned again in verses 16 and 29. In verse 2, Nebuchadnezzar is uh, referred to as Belshazzar's father, but that doesn't mean that he was the actual son of Nebuchadnezzar. You see, the Arabs and the Babylonians use the words father and son uh, for a variety of meanings, including ancestor or even predecessor. As for King Belshazzar, ruling Babylon, uh, critics have used this to try to discredit 
uh, the Bible by saying there was no such king in Babylon. Now, this is really important. Uh, by trying to discredit the Bible, they would also discredit the message. Understand? Discredit the Bible, you discredit the message. And that's why the testimony of a believer is so important. You, you discredit the believer and you discredit anything they have to say regarding Christ. And that's why over and over, over and over, the Bible exhorts us to follow Christ, to let the Holy Spirit rule in our lives, to yield to God, to obey God's word. And, and when the message is discredited, you think about this for a moment, the result is there's no longer any consequence for sin, there's no accountability for unbelief, and if there's no accountability for unbelief, then there's no judgment. Now, since 1854, much evidence has been found to demonstrate the accuracy of Daniel's writings, proving that Belshazzar did in fact live and was both the son and co-ruler with Nebuchadnezzar, the last king of Babylon. Now, Daniel was aware of Nebuchadnezzar as evidenced by the phrase third ruler in the kingdom. But he did not mention him by name because he played no event. He had no part in what we're going to be speaking about in chapter 5. And for all practical reasons, uh, Belshazzar was the only king the people had contact with. So now we begin chapter 5. It includes a night of prophetic fulfillment when God replaced the head of gold, which represented Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. He replaced it with the breast and arms of silver, representing the Medo-Persian Empire. Read with me Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Now, as I already explained, Belshazzar was the eldest son and co-regent of uh, his father, King Nabonidus. And he continued in that capacity until the fall of Babylon, which took place in 539 BC. Now, archaeological finds indicate that there were halls in the city of Babylon large enough for gatherings of this size and even larger. So a feast for a thousand nobles was certainly not unusual for that time. However, what was unusual was the situation surrounding the feast. We'll get into this in just a moment. You see, by this time now, as chapter five unfolds, as this feast is taking place, the Medes and Persians had already captured Belshazzar's father, King Nabonidus, as well as all the territory and provinces surrounding the city of Babylon. Only Babylon, with its massive walls and fortifications, remained intact. Now, possibly, Belshazzar held this feast believing that Babylonian gods would protect them and also to encourage his leaders. Dr. Walford, Dr. Walford, you know who he is. He was the uh, president of Dallas Theological Seminary for many years and a great scholar on uh, prophecy. He said this. He said the expression, drinking wine in the presence of the thousand, right here in verse 1, indicates that Belshazzar was probably on a platform at a higher level than the other guests and led them in drinking toast to their Babylonian deities. Under the stimulus of wine, and this is important, the thought occurred to Belshazzar to bring in the gold and silver vessels taken from the temple in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar almost 70 years prior to this. The implica uh, implication in the clause in verse 2, when Belshazzar tasted the wine, is that Belshazzar, in his right mind, probably would not have committed this sacrilegious act. And so now the text presents this 
feast, if you will, as symbolic of the world system with its focus on what? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Here you had a city under siege, and the people do what? They indulge in this feast to the point of intoxication, as many scholars believe. Now, just think for a moment. You, you think it's any different today? You, you see, what I find is people are willing to follow anyone who will entertain them and satisfy their appetites. Whatever those appetites might be. Why worry about the enemy when you think you have security, you're safe, and you have plenty to eat and drink? Again, this could have been Belshazzar's thinking, nobody knows for sure, as he held that large feast while the Persian army was camped outside the city gates, laying siege to Babylon. He must have felt secure in this great city with its fortified bronze gates and its massive walls protecting the city. Greek historian Herodotus claimed that Babylon surpasses in wonder any city in the known world, and he specifically praised the walls, which he said were 56 miles long, 80 feet thick, and up to 320 feet high. That's massive. I can't even imagine walls that high. It's like a mountain. It's like building a city on a mountain. He wrote that the walls were so thick that chariot races were held on top of them. The city inside the walls, he said, occupied an area of 200 square miles, which today would be roughly the size of the entire uh, Chicago area. Also, the city was self-sustaining because the Euphrates River ran through the city, which provided water, and knowing about the siege, because this just didn't happen overnight, they had supplied enough food to last up to 20 years. You see, Belshazzar had a plan. His plan was, don't worry about what's going on outside around us. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. But the Lord had a different plan. His plan was that Babylon's time had come to an end. This reminds us of Psalm 33, verses 10 through 11, which reads, The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. In other words, the will of God will be done regardless of what man does. That, actually, that makes me feel good. Doesn't it make you feel good to know that there isn't anyone out there that could do anything to us apart from what God wants? Now, having this feast during the siege showed Belshazzar's true character. You know, it's important that we understand this. Uh, words do not describe character, actions do. Okay? Words do not describe character, actions do. When we talk about the things of God, we better act upon the things of God. He showed his true disregard for that which is sacred to others, and for the dangers surrounding all of them. He was their leader. Like Nebuchadnezzar, his false peace and confidence was in the things of the world. This makes me think of what Paul would write many, many centuries later in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. He's saying, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. Now, even more important than this, his actions at the feast showed his contempt for God. This brings us to his drunkenness. 
The very first part of verse 2, we read, When Belshazzar tasted the wine. Now, I want you to note, remember what Dr. Walbert said. But the drinking of wine here is mentioned four times in the text. The Holman Bible interprets verse 2 as under the influence of wine. The design here, according to most scholars, is to describe his conduct and to show the effect this wine had upon him. His drinking set a bad example for his nobles, and evidently not only he, but all of them, drank too much. Montgomery, another scholar, comments, the king must have lost his sense of decency to commit to what is the oriental view a sacrilege even with the holy things of another religion. He said it's safe to conclude the king was intoxicating, intoxicated and his judgment had become impaired. Proverbs 20 verse 1 reads, wine produces mockers. Alcohol leads to brawls. Those led astray by drink cannot be wise. Cannot be wise. Now listen, folks. I have been at affairs, Christian affairs, where the wine flowed freely. And I remember one in particular. There were pastors, there were elders of a church, there, not my church, but there were elders of a church there drinking like there was no tomorrow, just walking around with the booze in their hands. And there were folks at this affair that were offended by this, but it just didn't seem to matter. I guess being a stumbling block to your brother didn't apply to them. And so we need to be very careful of the things we do. We need to be very careful in whether or not we are offending other people, especially brothers and sisters. You know why? It's a discredit to God. It's a discredit to God. There's just no other way to say it. His drunkenness led to his irreverence. Look at verse, verses 2b, the, the last part of verse 2 and verse 3. He... Belshazzar gave orders to bring the gold and silver, ves and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. They brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. Now, these holy vessels were taken by Nebuchadnezzar when he invaded Israel. When the nobles and guests drank from them, it was like saying their gods were more powerful. Their gods were victorious over Israel's God. Now, perhaps the king did this to encourage the nobles and the people at the feast in, in the face of this Persian siege of the city. I, I don't know. Whatever the reason, it was irreverent to God. You see, Belshazzar overlooked this one fact, very important, the most important fact. These cups were the sacred vessels of the living and true God. They were holy. They were set apart for the use of the Lord and his service alone. They were not to be used for any other reason. Thus, when the king and his guests began to drink from these, they were actually committing blasphemy against the Lord. Now, I want you to think of this principle, okay? In much the same way, God's vessels today are being desecrated, not by the unbelievers, but by the believers who are not living for Christ. You see, the Bible is clear. If you belong to Christ, you are his vessel. Okay, let, let me say that again. If you belong to Christ, you are his vessel. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 4 through 5, Paul wrote this to the church, that each of you know how to possess what? His own vessel. That's you. You know how to possess 
yourself in sanctification. That means being set apart and used for the things of God. And verse 5, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And God will hold us accountable just like he's going to hold Belshazzar accountable. Now his irreverence, Belshazzar's irreverence led to idolatry, verse 4 of chapter 5. They drank the wine and did what? They praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So using God's sacred vessels to do what? To commit idolatry, to, to praise these pagan gods. Now this whole episode, this whole episode should be a warning for believers to stay away from gatherings or any situations where drinking can often usually leads to immoral behavior. And during, you see, drinking, it, it was it do? It dulls the senses. It dulls the ability to reason. It causes us to what? To lower our standards. It weakens our morals, and it leaves the door wide open for bad behavior that will later be regretted. This led to what? The writing on the wall. Now, God's timing is always precise. In the same hour of Belshazzar's mocking God, God interfered with what? The finger of God, and he wrote a message on the wall describing his judgment for Belshazzar. Look at verse 5, Daniel chapter 5, verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Now, the very popular phrase, the handwriting on the wall, comes from this verse. And what did it do? It announced the coming judgment. Now, I want you to note, the finger of God has been busy all throughout history. The Egyptians recognized the judgments of the plagues upon them as the finger of God. Read with me Exodus 8.19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is what? The finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord said. The finger of God is what carved out the two tablets of stone for Moses on Mount Sinai. Look at Exodus 31.18. When he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone written by what? The finger of God. It was the finger of God in the New Testament that cast out demons, Luke eleven twenty. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God scattered the accusers of a woman caught in adultery. Look at John chapter 8, verse 6. They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. The writing on the wall here brought out what? Man's fear. Verse 6, Daniel chapter 5. Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. Now, I, I would say he was kind of frightened. No doubt, the mood quickly changed, and they sobered up. The drinking, the mocking suddenly stops. The musicians stop playing, and all eyes were focused on this wall, as the finger of God, the hand, wrote four words. Now, sensing something was wrong, the king's face turned pale. His knees began to knock so much that his legs gave way and he collapsed to the floor in terror. This led to what? His call for help. But just like Nebuchadnezzar, his predecessor, he called for help to the wrong people, looking for them in the wrong place for help. Who did he call? 
He called the occult, the magicians. Look at verses 7 through 9. The king called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to these wise men of Babylon, any man who could read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and have authority as what? Third ruler in the kingdom. That would be just on the king Belshazzar. Verse 8, then all the king's wise men came in but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was what? Greatly alarmed. His face grew even paler, and his nobles were perplexed. Belshazzar's offer of wealth and power to be the third highest ruler in the kingdom to anyone who could understand what was written revealed his what? Is tremendous fear. Yet just like before, the wise men of Babylon or their gods simply couldn't help. <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing to think for a moment. His gods and his wise men could do nothing. What a helpless position to be in. And the king knew this knew this. But now here's an interesting point, okay? They saw the words of God on the wall, but none of them could understand what the words uh, meant or what the explanation was. Only the man of God can understand the word of God. This is so important. 1 Corinthians 2.14, what do we read? The man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. You see, this explains why people laugh at Christians, why people mock us when we speak of end times, when we speak of judgment, when we speak of rapture, when we speak of living to honor God. They simply cannot understand when we say we must live in truth, we must walk in truth. We must live our lives according to the Bible. You see, as Paul continues in, in verse 14, he tells us why. They cannot understand them. They cannot understand the things of God, and he tells us because they are spiritually discerned. Now, that word discern means to examine and to scrutinize. They cannot do this. And the reason why they cannot do this is because the ability to do this only comes from the Holy Spirit. And, it, 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 and so if the Holy Spirit is not living inside of us, we simply cannot understand the things of God. And that, this is why the things of God are foolishness to other people. Now, I, I hope this helps us to understand why people make fun of us, why people mock the things we say in relationship to the Bible. They just simply do not understand. And I hope that encourages us to keep doing it, to keep doing it and pray that they would become born again, if you will, so the Spirit of God would enter into their lives and then they could understand God's Word and they could understand the things of God. Then we read that they, they finally come to call, uh, put out a call to the prophet. Look at verses 10 through 12 in chapter 5. Now it reads, The queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. We read this in chapter 2 when Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. And then she says, let Daniel now be summoned and he will declare the interpretation. Now, the queen undoubtedly heard what was going on in the hall and she came in. But she was not Belshazzar's wife because the text had already stated that the wives of the kings, including his concubines, were already present. So she was not his wife. Most scholars believe she was the queen mother and most likely the wife of Nabonidus and Nebuchadnezzar's daughter because she seems to have observed Daniel's ministry during the, the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So now here, in the text, Daniel was offered a reward. Read with me verses 13 through 16. Let me take a drink first, I'm getting dry. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? Now I have heard about you, that you, that a spirit of the gods is in you. What a testimony. What a testimony. And that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Verse 15. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me, that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple. Purple was a sign of royalty. And wear a necklace of gold around your neck and you will have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. So in other words, he would be just under the king in authority. I want you to note now here how the king emphasized that Daniel was an exile, uh, a captive, a little bit better than a slave. And his words, whom my father the king brought from Judah, uh, no doubt alluded to his older age because by now Daniel was an older man. Nevertheless, nevertheless, even though the king, I would say, kind of put him down by calling his attention that he was an exile, a Jew, it, it, Daniel is presented in mock contrast to all these so-called wise men of Babylon. Note the king's words when he spoke of those wise men, or as, as I say, those occult people, when he said they could not. But then this is what he said to Daniel, but I have heard that you are able. I like that. Think about that for a moment. They could not, but you are able. You know, that makes me think of what Paul said in Philippians 4, relating to his purpose in life, relating to the ministry that Christ personally gave him when he was on the road to Damascus, when Paul said, I can do all things through him, Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. And here, the king said to Daniel, these wise men can't do it, but you are able. That's how we have to think because greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. Now, it's certainly surprising to me, at least, that Belshazzar, this king, seemed to know nothing about Daniel, considering he held one of the highest offices in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Added to this is the fact that uh, Belshazzar knew about his grandfather's dream and insanity, as well as his recovery, and that he was restored to the throne with even greater glory than he had 
before his sickness fell upon him. Now note here, Daniel was an older man, probably somewhere between 80 and 90, and he was still being used by God, still being used by God. And, you know, I want to encourage older folks. You know, sometimes people get older and they think, oh, well, I've got, I've got no use anymore. My legs hurt, my arms hurt, my feet hurt. I can't do this, I can't do that. We have to stop thinking like that. We have to think like I can do it. I can be of use to God. I could be a benefit to building the kingdom of God, to strengthening the church, to encouraging other believers, to praying for other believers. I can do something for God. Use me, Lord. That should be how we think. That should be how we think. And, and even at that age, think about this for a moment. He's 80 to 90, somewhere in there. He was still being used by God. And what did they still say about him? The spirit of the gods is in you. Wow. Wouldn't you like someone to come to you at any age and say, I can tell you're a person of God. You know how I could tell that? Because the Spirit of God is working in you. And I could, I could tell, not because you say nice things, but because of what you do, because of how you live your life. That's what we want people to say about us. Now, there's no record of what Daniel did after Nebuchadnezzar's death until this incident. Now, possibly he was removed from his position of rank by those who succeeded who came after Nebuchadnezzar. However, the king here offers him riches and authority of the third most powerful man in the kingdom if he would just tell the king, what does this handwriting mean? Now, it's apparent here that Belshazzar had no interest in God, and unbeknown to him, he was about to lose his life. Uh, this reminds me of what Jesus uh, wrote and in, in, said in Luke chapter 12, verses uh, 20, 21. God said to him, you fool. This is about the rich man building this bigger bond. This very night your soul is required of you. That was the case with Belshazzar. This very night his soul would be accounted before him and he would have to give an account to God. We read in Daniel 5.17, this is how Daniel responded to the king's offer of this fantastic reward. Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. Daniel graciously refuses this reward. And instead, he said he would interpret the handwriting. You see, his refusal showed he was not swayed by money or power. You see, he wasn't going to use the ability God gave him to serve in this way to make money or power. Now, don't get me wrong here. This doesn't mean that people who are in ministry shouldn't be receiving a power. This was an opportunity. And this was a pagan king who disregarded the things of God, who blasphemed God, who paid no attention to the word of God. And Daniel was not going to allow himself to be bought. You understand there's a big difference here. Daniel was a servant of Israel's God who was called to help people, not fleece them. Now, there's plenty of fleeces out there, let me tell you. We read this in verses 18 through 23. O king, the most high God granted sovereignty, grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive, and whoever he wished, he elevated, and whoever he wished, 
He humbled, verse 20. And this is the important part. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed, he was taken down from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. Verse 21. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beasts and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given access to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. Verse 22. This is important. This is important. Yet you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all this. Ah, now he sets the record straight. You knew this, king. You knew this. And yet, in spite of knowing this, this is what you did. This is how you insulted the God of Israel. This is how you committed sacrilege. Verse 23. He said, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. You see, you knew this. And still, you exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven and brought out the vessels of his house before you. And you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, have been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And this is what he said about these gods they were praising. They do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways, you have not glorified. Wow. You know, that's just like today, as I think of this. People worship their money, their power, their position, their homes, their cause, which could do nothing for them. And, and as we look at eternity, all these things we have on this earth will do nothing for us because they're not going into eternity. They're staying here. But the very God, the very God who holds our life in our hands, many people just completely disregard. Hmm. Have not glorified. 19th century philosopher G.W.F. Hegel said this. He said, the only thing we learn from history is that we have learned nothing from history. Let me say that again. The only thing we learn from history is that we have learned nothing from history. That was a fundamental truth about Belshazzar. You see, I guess you could say he was what? Unteachable. What did he learn? Absolutely nothing. Without hesitation, Daniel sternly rebuked the king for knowing about his grandfather's experiences and he refused to follow in the footsteps of his grandfather as far as the act of repentance going to acknowledge Israel's God as the only true and living God. Instead, he acted arrogantly and he actually insulted the God of Israel. Then it comes to the interpretation in verses 24 through 28. This is Daniel speaking to the king. Then the hand was sent from him and this inscription was written out. Verse 25. Now this is the inscription that was written out. Many, many tekel a parson. Verse 26. This is the interpretation of the message. Many. God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Verse 27. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Ah. You see, Daniel's uh, uh, 
interpretation was not a warning to Belshazzar, rather it was a pronouncement of judgment. You see, the time for warning and repentance was over. You remember in the beginning when we started this book, I said one of the outstanding things we learn from the book of Daniel is God's patience for sin is limited, is limited. And here, <laughs> the limit ran out. It was over. The king went too far in his sinful behavior, and as a result, he was to immediately feel God's hand of judgment upon him. This led to his fall, verses 39, 29 through 31. Then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler of the kingdom. That same night, though, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 60. To, well, Daniel's ruler as third kingdom in the third ruler in the kingdom certainly didn't last too long. Now, Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the Medo-Persian army surprised the Babylonians by lowering the level of the Euphrates River. Now, remember that wall was impregnable; there was no way they could get in. But the river ran through the city, city at one end and then the other. So what the Persians did was they diverted the water so that his soldiers could march in, probably at calf or knee level, march into the city, and the Babylonians were not prepared. There were no guards anywhere where the river was because they felt their, their, their city and the walls were impregnable. So the surprise element was enhanced, wrote Herodotus, by the fact that the Babylonian leaders were engaged in some sort of celebration. This was no doubt a reference to Belshazzar's feast. Now, those who doubt God's sovereignty would reject this sudden destruction as having nothing to do with God. Yet, Daniel tells us it had everything to do with God. You, you see here, the lesson is this, and this goes for everyone today too, that people are so hardened to the things of God and so involved with their own affairs, their own life, that even though they're at the brink of destruction, they don't even know it. They don't even know it. People do not realize how far they have drifted away from the things of God. And, and the popular thinking that it can't happen to me is what? It's a prelude to failure. How necessary it is for the United States to be aware of this as the most powerful nation of the world. And yet, we're in danger of thinking that this power is the answer to all problems. Oh boy. I don't see that today. I, I think our nation is in terrible shape. We're a nation divided. There's so much evil and hatred in our country. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't know. And, and what we see is people do not deliberately choose to plunge over the cliff, but they edge toward it slowly and little by little until they're no longer even aware that there is danger. And, and this is what makes a disaster seem sudden and unexpected, until the last moment that they are feasting without any awareness that the enemy is standing at the gate. This could be true of many of us. How many times we see a person go down with unbelievable suddenness and ask, how did it happen? How did it happen? People have been saying that about our country. How did this happen? How did we get to this point of, of immoral behavior, of such strong division, of such unprecedented hatred and disrespect and immorality? How did it happen? Well, the answer is, 
It was not suddenly. This just didn't happen. It's been happening slowly over a period of time, and it's been ignored and ignored and ignored until all of a sudden it just poof, blows up in your face. You see, outward appearances could fool many, but inside the cup could be full. The false feeling of safety and self-satisfaction makes one unable to discern the signs of the times. You know how many believers there are right now who do not realize that we're in the end times, the time before the return of Jesus Christ? And, and it's like the church is asleep. It's asleep over these things. And many could be like Clarence Day's father. Now let me explain. Clarence Day was an American author and cartoonist, best known for his 1935 work, Life with Father. This is what he wrote. He said, there was a depression that afflicted mother, which father was free from. He never once had any moments of feeling unworthy. This was a puzzle to mother, and it made her look at father with a mixture of awe and annoyance. She said other people went to church to be made better. She told him, why don't you? And he replied in astonishment to her that he had no need to be better. He was all right as he was. Hmm. Clarence Day's father, like so many today, are completely unaware of their unworthiness and unaware of the closeness of disaster. You see, unaware of the coming judgment which might have been prevented if only they had eyes to see. I want to close with this verse, Proverbs 14, 12. I don't know how many times I've used this with people who think they know better, who think they're going to approach God on their goodness or those who believe there is no God, there is no judgment, there is no accountability for sin. But this is what God's Word says. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. And that death is spiritual death, eternal separation from the only true and living God, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I just want to thank you for this time and for chapter 5 of Daniel. My Lord, how we, there are so many lessons for us to learn. I pray that we let your word uh, richly dwell in our hearts and minds and that we are wise to learn from the word of God. And that we never do things that discredit you or dishonor you, dis dishonor you. Help us to be like Daniel. Help us to be recognizable as one who has the spirit of the living God indwelling us. So that you would receive the glory and honor. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Until next time. Amen. This message was brought to you from Cross Angle Ministries, where faith meets fact. To learn more about Cross Angle Ministries and Pastor Sal Massa, visit us online at crossangleministries.com.